Lecture 18, Deadlock Avoidance. In examining deadlock as a topic, we've introduced the informal definition. We've replaced that with a better, more formal definition. Uh, and when we discussed the formal definition, we covered the idea of deadlock's constituent elements. That is to say that there are four things that make up deadlock, uh, and they are if you don't recall, mutual exclusion, hold and wait, no preemption, and a cycle in the resource allocation graph. Now, other than ignore it, which admittedly was worth talking about, even if just for a minute, uh, what about the other thing we've tried so far? We tried deadlock prevention. Now, in prevention... We're attempting to ensure that deadlock never happens by ruling it out categorically. That is, we eliminate one of the conditions that makes deadlock possible, and if we know that that's not the case, if any one of those is absent because we have successfully eliminated it, then okay, we're certain that there is no risk of a deadlock. Unfortunately, as we saw, uh, eliminating each of those three things was not a certainty. We could sometimes get away with eliminating mutual exclusion by, you know, copying data so things wouldn't be necessary. We could sometimes get away uh, removing hold and wait uh, by using tri-lock behavior, but not every resource is suitable for that, and the same is really true of preemption, even if we had the choice. So, um, yeah, all we've really managed to do is make it less likely, and therefore I think we're forced to conclude that we can't live in a world where deadlock is impossible. All we can do is work with a system where it's possible and then try to avoid that occurrence. And this ultimately takes us to the key distinction between deadlock prevention and deadlock avoidance. Prevention is ruling it out for uh, the whole system. Avoidance is we live in a world where deadlock could happen, but we're going to try our hardest to never get in that situation. So yeah, uh, just because a deadlock is possible doesn't mean that deadlock is inevitable. That is, we can take some steps to avoid it if we think there is a danger of it actually happening. Uh, and we could see there are some strategies that we can use to identify do we think there is a danger of deadlock happening, uh, and the goal is to stay out of danger. So, yeah, you know, can we do that? Well, the basic strategy for that is do not allow a cycle in the resource allocation graph. And that would prevent the fourth condition from ever being fulfilled, and that would mean a deadlock wouldn't happen. This is something that we might have some control over. Uh, we can choose, when we're writing a program, what resources are requested, and you know, the strategy for requesting them, and in what order, and what have you. So this is, uh, this is something that's really up to us. Some of the things that we needed for deadlock prevention uh, were just not in our hands. You, know, you don't control preemption, uh, because, well, that's the operating system's job, and uh, you're just kind of out of luck if the operating system doesn't give you any possibility to do that. Uh, and, yeah, we can't make them. I mean, okay, it, in principle, in Linux or something, you could submit a patch, uh, which would uh, allow you to uh, you know, uh, turn on this feature given this function call, but uh, good luck getting that one past Linus. Uh, however, if you do, hats off to you. Um, now, the goal uh, to stay out of trouble uh, is, again, keeping in mind a resource allocation graph. I mean, you could build one, or you could just sort of imagine what one looks like. You don't necessarily have to draw it or represent it using a graph representation. But we just have to prevent the state of the system being such that if you drew a resource allocation graph of it, it would show a cycle. In the Dining Philosopher's Problem, one of the th ways that we thought about how could we get around this problem, what could we do that would prevent the philosophers from getting stuck, one of the strategies was hire a bouncer, uh, and if the bouncer prevents um, you know, any philosophers from sitting at the table, uh, whether it was we limit it to one or two or four, even though the table has five seats, we said that worked, but I didn't really go into detail as to why. Uh, and the correct answer as to why is that with four philosophers and five chopsticks, there are insufficient requests to form a cycle. 
right? If uh, we have, uh, if you, if we have an image of the um, dining philosophers you know, sitting at their table, so to speak, um, then problem occurs when there is a cycle when philosopher one is waiting for two, two is waiting for three, three is waiting for four, four is waiting for five, and five is waiting for one. Now, if we, you know, send one of those philosophers away, so they're not sitting at the table, then philosopher one is waiting for two, two is waiting for three, three is waiting for four, but four is not waiting for anybody because there's an empty seat next to them. So then there are insufficient requests, and we don't have a cycle. You know, there, there is, you know, in the resource allocation graph, um, you know, some arrows that connect all four philosophers, but it isn't a cycle the way that it is when there's five. So sometimes that kind of solution is suitable, that if you know that resources are limited uh, and uh, there's no good way to uh, prevent a scenario where everybody gets some but not enough of what they need, then you can rely on you know, reducing the number of concurrent requests so that resources are distributed, I'll say more unevenly, um, but it is sufficient. That's good, but I wouldn't call this a generalizable to all deadlock situations. There are lots of situations and you can't always prevent it by saying, well, only this many threads are allowed to run at a time. So, uh, in, in the words of the uh, legendary Speaker of the UK House of Commons, John Burko, order, or as he puts it, order. Um, now, uh, if, if you didn't watch any of the uh, Brexit debates or, around uh, around oh, 2019 or so. Uh, you might not be entirely familiar with this fine fellow, but he has a real commanding voice, and uh, I, I certainly wish that uh, I sounded like him. But uh, this is what you're stuck with for oh, however many lecture hours of this course remain. Sorry. Um, you'll remember also uh, when we talked about deadlock we looked at something like this where we had thread p on the left where it does wait on a and then wait on b uh, and then we have a critical section and then signal uh, or post again they're equivalent uh, i've managed to stamp out most cases where it said signal but apparently not here on this thread uh, and with thread q uh, there is a wait on b a wait on a uh, a critical section uh, and then uh, our signal statements Okay. Deadlock doesn't take place, I've established, uh, if both threads requested these two resources in the same order, and the thing is that it doesn't matter whether we choose A then B, alphabetical order, or B then A, reverse alphabetical order. Um, some natural ordering might be obvious, there might be a reason why this would work. Um, and don't think that this is hypothetical. Um, I, a couple years back, helped somebody debug a problem that they were having uh, that involved locks, uh, and you know, they would get a deadlock on occasion if they got uh, two messages for the same shipment. Uh, and well, why does this happen? Well, the shipment has containers, uh, and uh, it would lock each container and then try to you know, update all of them and everything. And if the containers were in different orders on the two messages, you could get a deadlock because you know, it, it just replace A with a container number and B with a different container number and you can see how this goes wrong. Uh, and the solution to this, of course, was sort the containers before you try to acquire their respective locks. Uh, and it ensures that things always happen in some order. Um, so why does this work? Well, this is, as far as I can recall, the one time there might be like formal mathematical reasoning about this kind of thing in the course. Uh, I certainly do not expect you to memorize proofs or anything. You may have had a professor who made you do that and they might not be your favorite uh, for that or unrelated reasons. Um, but this will just demonstrate why it is the case. So um, if the set of all the resources in the system is the set R, which is composed of R0, R1, R2, all the way up to Rm, if we assign to each resource a unique integer value, we have some function f of Ri maps a resource to an integer value, this integer value is used for the purposes of comparison, uh, and the rule that you want to enforce is that if a process has been assigned a particular resource Ri, you can request a resource with a different number only if the other resources, the new ones, number is bigger than the one that you currently have. It is important to note that's a strictly greater than relationship, not that that's really a concern 
uh, in practice. Uh, and in, in theory, if you need more than one of you know, the same resource, you have to request all of those at the same time. So if you're requesting memory or something, you request it in a big chunk and not one byte at a time, fine. Not, not super relevant but uh, in there for completeness. Uh, and if you want a resource uh, with a, a lower number than ones you're currently holding on to, then you have to release any resources to, so that uh, you're not holding any resources with higher numbers than the one that you want. Uh, and if you follow those rules, the circular weight condition cannot hold. Uh, and there is a, a proof of this, um, and it's a proof by contradiction kind of thing. Um, if you want to think about that between now and when we get there, um, by all means, uh, it, it's not too difficult uh, as, uh, as mathematical proofs go. But again, it's not a key objective of this course that you learn how to prove this. If uh, your intention is to simply take my word for it, I will not object. But yeah, the idea is that uh, we assign numbers to resources, uh, and then resources have to be acquired in the order that corresponds to that number, uh, and this guarantees that we get a consistent ordering. Now, a consistent ordering is fine, any consistent ordering, so the function by which we assign integers uh, is not super important as long as it assigns unique integers to different resources. No big deal. We'll find out uh, when when we get to uh, you know, analyzing for uh, lock ordering problems, which uh, admittedly is still a few lectures ahead, um, how Helgrind, uh, one of the tools of the Valgrind suite, actually does this, and we'll find that it will look for lock ordering problems by assigning uh, an integer value to locks and seeing if you acquire them in the right order, and it has a way of determining what is the right order. Um, that's another one if you want to think about it. Uh, yes, uh, I suppose you could, you know, skip ahead to that video uh, and see if someone kindly left you a comment that tells you the answer, but uh, I would prefer that you think about it, how you would assign those integers to resources. Um, so here's the proof. Uh, and like I said, it is a proof by contradiction. So we will assume that a circular weight is present, uh, and we'll declare that we have a set of processes, P0 to Pn, could be any any of those, uh, and resources are R0 to Rn, uh, again, arbitrarily many of those, uh, and we have a cycle that's formed as process Pi awaits for resource Ri, and that resource is currently assigned to process I plus 1. Uh, the exception is, of course, the last one in the chain, Pn, which waits for resource Rn that is held by process P0. Uh, and so, uh, since process Pi plus 1 holds resource Ri while requesting Ri plus 1, it means that the integer value assigned to resource i is less than the resource assigned to Ri plus 1. Uh, but that means that uh, the integer value for R0 is less than 1, which is less than that of resource 2, 3, and so on, all the way up to n, but also less than R0, otherwise the request would not be allowed. Uh, and it can't be the case that uh, the integer value for R0 is less than itself. Um, you know, that, that goes back to uh, just sort of basic mathematical inequalities when you learned about the greater than and equal sign, and, you know, the alligator eats the bigger number or something, you know, this, this doesn't work. So it's a contradiction, and uh, that demonstrates, in fact, that uh, we could not possibly have a circular weight. So like I said, I think that is the only mathematical proof in the course, uh, and you, again, please don't memorize it. Okay, but if I asked you, how do you apply this to the dining philosopher's problem, what would you say? And uh, I'll give you a minute to think about that before we go and uh, reveal the answer. Okay, so one of the things, of course, is that we tell the philosophers that they have to pick up chopsticks, you know, uh, in some order. That requires that we devise some sort of order for them to work with. So, what do we do? Well, I mean, it's reasonably straightforward. You just you know, assign every chopstick a number, and you can uh, just... 
draw it on in permanent marker for all that it matters, uh, as long as there is a number associated with every chopstick. Uh, and then we tell the philosophers that they are required to request the chopsticks that they want or try to acquire the chopsticks that they want in ascending order, uh, that is from smaller numbers up to the largest number. So um, we'll assume that philosophers are agreeable to this behavior and, you know, they don't ask too many questions about why. Um, but the first philosopher will request zero, which is on her left, and then one on her right. The second philosopher requests chopstick one and then chopstick two, and so on and so on. And this r continues until the last philosopher, who under the previous scenario would have always chosen the chopstick on their left first. Uh, which would have been chopstick four, and then the one on their right, which would have been chopstick zero. But under the new rules, that's forbidden. So this philosopher must request then zero on his right, and then four on his left, because it has rules. Uh, and these rules must be followed. So the last philosopher will be blocked when trying to acquire chopstick zero, and it means that chopstick four is available for the second to last philosopher, uh, and thus deadlock is avoided. Uh, and you can run through all kinds of scenarios about this uh, and you know, sort of try to work out what's actually going to happen. Uh, but ultimately, whatever happens with chopstick acquisition, uh, everybody will have either one, zero, or two. Uh, and if you are the philosopher with two, you can eat, you can put your chopsticks down, and then they become available for others, and therefore uh, other people will be able to eat, uh, but you can't have the situation where everybody ends up with exactly one. Imagine, if you will, uh, that philosopher uh, philosopher one uh, and uh, philosopher five are fighting over chopstick zero. They both want the same one. For philosopher one, it's on their left, and for philosopher uh, five, it's on their right. One of them will win. If it is philosopher one, they might pick up the left chopstick, fail to pick up the other one, but in that case, Philosopher 5 is blocked and will not try to get chopstick 4 because he's waiting for chopstick 0. That means that chopstick 4 is available for Philosopher 4, who can get it, who can eat, uh, and problem is solved, day is saved. Alternatively, if the last Philosopher gets chopstick 0, it means that they have one of them, and philosopher, uh, and philosopher um, one has none. Uh, and again, they will get blocked. They were trying to get chopstick zero. And in fact, once you demonstrate that in this scenario there is a philosopher that has none, we're actually already done. The rest follows immediately. Uh, and that is, if somebody has zero chopsticks, uh, and there are remaining four philosophers and five chopsticks, the pigeonhole principle tells you that somebody has two. So if you wanted to run all possibilities, all you really have to do is prove that in any case, when two philosophers fight over a chopstick, one of them gets it. Whichever one loses that race will have zero chopsticks and will be stuck with zero for the moment, in which case... Uh, of the remaining chopsticks, there are five, uh, okay, four if you count one that's already assigned to somebody, um, uh, and there are uh, four philosophers, and so when you hand out the chopsticks by the pigeonhole principle, uh, then somebody will have two of them, they will eat, they will free up the resources. Uh, I believe the correct mathematical uh, term for this is, is you would say without loss of generality, you would name then a couple of philosophers, and the point is it doesn't matter if it's philosophers 1 and 2 or 2 and 3 or 3 and 4, uh, not really important, so spin the table around, change the labels, it's all the same. So yeah, that would work. That would work. So yeah, we've demonstrated that actually if we apply ordering of resources and it is strictly enforced, then the philosophers will not starve. Uh, this also shows why inviting a left-handed person works, uh, because the left-handed person uh, in this case you know, does things in the opposite order. They're the person who has chopstick four and zero, so they have to request them in a different order than the other philosophers would. Now in development, ordering is enforced by coding convention and code review generally. There's no that I know of like operating system mechanism that would require you to acquire resources in the correct order. It can be detected at runtime if you did it wrong. That's a thing. Um, but um, you need to generally make sure that you know, everybody does what they are supposed to do. So if mutexes are acquired in alphabetical order or their order in some file or something like that, 
Um, if everybody can follow that, there's no issue. Um, but sometimes it's not as simple because one mutex can be referenced in two pointers. Uh, and I said previously, names aren't always consistent because you can have you know, the sender account and the receiver account, and they each have their own mutex called lock. And you know which is correct because you know this time it could be the sender is uh, account A and the receiver is account B, but also concurrently uh, there is also a transaction the sender is B and the recipient is A. So it gets complicated. It gets complicated. We will have to think about uh, how to acquire them in the correct order. Stay alert and stay safe. Okay, we're going to um, take a couple of minutes to watch an excerpt of a video uh, of a couple of uh, anthropomorphic rabbits, uh, which, yeah, is peak 90s, you know, trying to cash in on uh, popularity at that time of Looney Tunes and Tiny Tunes and what have you. Uh, but, hey, you know, why shouldn't you take life lessons from free VHS tapes handed out at Canadian Tire? So let's watch this, and then we will uh, return. And this is my brother, Bert. Hi, we're here to help you stay alert and stay safe. Yeah, so follow along. Watch out, beware. Things aren't always as they seem. We'll show you what we need. Keep your radar working. Stay alert. Stay safe. You know, things aren't always as they appear. And that goes for people, too. Some people that seem nice at first may be real bad news. So it's cool to keep your radar working and listen to your instincts. Yeah, our motto is stay alert and stay safe. Hmm, wonder what's up. Could be trouble. Hey there, Sonny. How do you get to Albany Avenue? What should you do if someone stops to talk or ask directions? Most strangers are nice people. But some strangers want to hurt kids. So you've always got to be on your toes. Let's see how Daniel handles it. So what do you say, Sonny? Two blocks that way and turn right. Can't miss it. Well, would you show me the way? Sorry, I've got to get home. Oh, I can drive you. Sorry. Way to be, Daniel. Give me five. Hi, Gert. Hi, Bert. You handled that just right. Yeah, if a stranger stops to talk, always keep your distance. And never, ever go anywhere with a stranger. Got it? Whoa! So first of all, uh, let me apologize for the terrible video quality. This is uh, what when I managed to find. Um, I don't think it would get that much better if I tried to pull it from a VHS tape. If I could find one and a VHS player and the adapter I would need. Uh, at the moment to digitize it. So, all right. Important takeaways. Yeah, don't get in cars with strangers. Great. Uh, what would these rabbits think of Uber or Lyft now that I think about it? Um, anyway, <laughs> point being, um, if you uh, take the, the lesson away from this uh, of uh, assume the worst case scenario, then the video has served its purpose. Now, um, is the guy in the car a murderer? I don't know. Well, I didn't see him commit any murders. I mean, certainly um, you know, his behavior was suspicious, but uh, I didn't see him commit any murders, and we don't know for sure that he is a murderer. And in fact, you know, most people are not murderers, so that's fine. You wouldn't take the chance, though. So we're going to assume the worst case scenario is what's going to happen. Uh, and yeah, we're always going to assume that there you know, is a murderer in the vehicle, and uh, if, we, you know, if we're if we wrong, 
we were perhaps overly cautious, but we're not dead. Uh, if we are correct, then, of course, you know, we've made the right decision. Okay. So here's our strategy. Instead of ordering resources, actually the process that wants to run has to give the operating system information about what resources it might want. So processes need to say in advance of execution what is the maximum number of resources of each type that they might conceivably need. In a tape drive system, you know, it's used for backups or something, you know, there's a tape drive, there's a printer, uh, and process A needs the tape drive first to read some data, then the printer to print it out, uh, and another process B uh, uses it in the opposite order, needs the printer and then the tape drive, uh, and knowing this, the operating system could then make more intelligent decisions about what processes should get you know, run when, uh, or when they should be made to wait, so that a deadlock does not occur. Now, to understand how the system would look at a particular state of the world, uh, there is a definition that we need to cover, which is a safe state. Now, a safe state uh, is uh, one in which there is some scheduling order, any one, it doesn't have to be uh, you know, the, the one that's actually taken, but there has to be a way out. There has to be a scheduling order in which every process can run to completion. Even if all processes suddenly request their maximum resources immediately, and that is part of the worst case scenario planning uh, that we want to consider in this case. So, yeah, it can't be the case uh, that how, um, all processes request their maximum resources and then we all get stuck for the state to be considered safe. Uh, and that is there has to be kind of a way out. So that's why we need to know in advance the maximum resources that could be required by this process. Uh, and more formally, a state is safe if there exists a safe sequence. A safe sequence is a sequence of processes, P1, P2, Pn, and so on, given the current state of allocations. Uh, if for each process, P1, that resource requests uh, that it can still make can be satisfied with the currently available resources uh, held, uh, plus resources held by other processes that terminated already, uh, ahead of the order. It will make more sense when we actually do an example of how we do this, but basically if we look at the state of the world right now, we'll see is there any process that can run to completion? If there is, then we'll say yeah, uh, pretend it runs to completion and releases its resources. When it does that, they're added to the pool, and then we can say, are there any other processes that could now complete? Uh, and if we do that, we would say, well, if they ran in the order of, let's say, process C, then D, then J, then A, that would work. You would say that is a safe sequence, those are all of the processes that are you know, alive right now, and there is a way for them all to finish. So... Uh, a safe sequence in that case would be the order in which those processes would run and would run to completion. Now, in reality, they don't necessarily run like that, and probably they don't want run one at a time the way we are describing, but we just need to know if it's possible. Right, if we are, for whatever reason, uh, not able to prove that the state is safe, that is to say our resource requests uh, can't, be, uh, can't be granted, based on uh, what we know right now, if everybody requests their maximum resources all at once, then we would say the state is unsafe. And that is, of course, the default. So the magic in it is about the determination of whether a state is safe or not tells us something about deadlock. If the system is in a safe state, it means that there could not possibly be a deadlock. Being in an unsafe state does not mean that there is one, but it means a deadlock is possible because, again, we do the worst case scenario analysis, uh, and uh, you can think of it as, you know, in the best case uh, scenario, of course, you know, nothing goes wrong, you don't get a deadlock, but if the state is unsafe and the worst case scenario happens, then a deadlock could occur. And so if you want to make sure that a deadlock is never going to happen, what you have to do is consider the worst case uh, and, you know, as the topic goes, avoid getting into trouble. Okay, like I said, I think this makes a lot more sense uh, if we actually 
look at a specific example. So let's try that. Uh, assume for the moment there's only one kind of resource and it has 10 instances. This is a simple example uh, to get us comfortable with the idea uh, and not a super good representation of reality, but let's start here and, uh, and move forward. So there's 10 resources total. There's three processes in this system, A, B, and C. Uh, a has three resources, and at the most it could need nine. B has two resources, and it may request up to four. C currently has two, and it may request up to seven. Uh, and there are, at the moment, three resources currently free, because of the ten uh, that exist, seven of them are presently assigned. Okay, so we have a you know, visual representation of the state shown here at the bottom. Um, so is this state safe? And uh, again, you can uh, take, take a look at it and uh, sort of analyze it and you know, tell me what you think. Uh, I remind you that uh, the assumption is that processes will want to request their maximum resources immediately, uh, and there has to exist a safe sequence uh, that is an order in which we run processes A, B, and C, assuming that when we start to run a process, uh, it, its resource allocation goes immediately to max. Okay. So is the state safe? Yes. The state is, in fact, safe. There exists a safe sequence, and you'll see how we actually get there. Um, so for a state to be safe, you need one path that allows all processes to complete. Uh, you could um, have more than one solution, and if you assign resources to the wrong process, then you don't get the outcome that you're looking for. Uh, in this case, because you know, if we look at our uh, initial state, which is shown as A in the uh, sequence diagram here at the, at the left, uh, then we would look at the processes uh, that exist, A, B, and C, you know, the ones that aren't finished yet, uh, and we'll say, well, we have three resources. Which process can we give them to? And if we give the free resources to process A, then you know, it goes to six of nine, so it doesn't have what it needs. B still has two of four, C has two of seven, and we get stuck. So obviously if we do that, you know, we've gone in the wrong direction. That would be a path that would lead us to deadlock, but we wouldn't consider that. We wouldn't try it because we know that's wrong. And so looking at the difference between what it has and the max, which of these three processes uh, has resource requests that we can satisfy? Obviously, the answer to that is B. It's the only one. So what we would do is assign the resources to B. Uh, and so B would get four out of four, uh, and then free resources would be one. Uh, and then we could assume that B runs to completion. So you know, it takes as long as it needs, but it runs to completion. And when it's done, it releases all of its resources. Uh, and so that shows us the state labeled C. Uh, B got four out of four in the previous state. It ran to completion, released all its resources. So B now has A and the free pool has five. Now, when you're writing this kind of thing, uh, you know, if you were writing it on paper, or if I was drawing it on a whiteboard or a chalkboard or something, I might skip intermediate state B once we're familiar with the concept because it's not adding much and requires me to reproduce a lot of stuff. You know, I would just say give resources to B and then jump straight to uh, the diagram labeled C. But of course, you know, uh, since this is the first time we are addressing this concept, showing the intermediate state might make it clearer how we get from one to the other. Um, then we repeat the process. So we know in our safe sequence, the first step, uh, at least our candidate safe sequence, is B. Uh, and then the question is, what do we do? Do we assign resources to A or C? Slam dunk decision, we assign the resources to C, it gets seven out of seven, uh, and can run to completion. Uh, and then uh, we can see that the seven resources are available, which is sufficient for A. 
you'll notice that the last step isn't shown. Oh, actually, the last two steps aren't shown where A gets 9 out of 9, uh, and then uh, we get uh, shown A with 0 and everything with 0 is because we're finished already. We have developed a safe sequence, uh, and it is B, then C, then A. Uh, and moreover, actually, once you're down to exactly one process left in the table, you know you're finished because deadlock would require two or more processes to be stuck. So if you get it down to one, you're finished, Whichever one is last is the last in the sequence. So that's good. So yeah, this diagram demonstrates that our state is safe uh, because there exists a safe sequence, B then C then A, that allows us to you know, continue uh, even if every process actually requests its maximum resources immediately. Okay, now let's consider a different example. Uh, so suppose that A requests a resource and it gets it. So in this case, our initial condition has changed such that A has four resources and there are two free resources. So in the diagram below, the state changes from A to B. The only difference, uh, again, is shown in the line with A, where A is now four uh, in the assigned column and uh, free is now down to two. Uh, and I mean, repeat the analysis. Is this a safe state? I'll let you uh, consider that for a moment. Okay, I mean, we would execute the same procedure that we did for the previous state. And uh, what does that look like? Well, uh, as, uh, as Ralph put it, I'm in danger. This state is unsafe. Now, I, as I said, this does not mean that, um, that necessarily a, a deadlock will occur. It does not mean a deadlock has occurred. It does not mean a deadlock is certain to occur in the future. It just means this is an unsafe state and a deadlock could happen in the worst case scenario. Okay, but why? Well, I'll walk you through the solution uh, if, if you haven't solved it uh, previously, which is that if we look with the two free resources, we can assign those to B, B can run to completion, and then the free pool of resources becomes four. Four is not sufficient for C, which would need five, and it's not sufficient for A, which would also need five, uh, and we therefore have a problem. So we can't give the resources to either A or C uh, and have that work. Uh, and therefore, we would say the state is not safe because there is no safe sequence. Right. Right. So, uh, yeah, this, uh, this is worst case scenario. And it is a way of analyzing our, uh, our situation. There's another approach that we could take to analyzing the situation, one that isn't based on you know, the grid and the table and all of that, uh, which is based directly on the resource allocation graph. So the core idea is, could we use the resource allocation graph to avoid deadlock? Maybe. Um, so an operating system will typically uh, maintain this resource allocation graph. The... Uh, the kind that we uh, want to talk about works if there's one instance of each resource and it still requires that uh, all resources are declared in advance. Uh, but okay, uh, we can live with that unless our operating system is weird and it you know, doesn't let you have resources, but I wouldn't worry about that. Um, and what we have to do is enhance our concept of the resource allocation graph a little bit. The previous version that we had uh, had two kinds of edges. There was a request edge and there was an assignment edge or allocation edge, however you wanted to call that. Uh, and so when a process requests a resource but it doesn't get it, that is a request edge. When a process is currently in possession of that resource, it has an assignment edge and you know, those both... Uh, work, they get the job done. To make this happen uh, for our you know, deadlock avoidance, we need a third kind of edge in the graph, and it's called a claim edge. And it's a way of indicating that a process might request a resource at some time, and it is drawn with a dashed line. So uh, the dashed lines will appear you know, at the beginning of time when the process you know, might want this resource. 
if a request actually occurs, then a uh, claim edge is re is turned into a request edge, so dotted line becomes solid. If the resource is granted, then uh, then it is you know, actually assigned, so uh, the uh, claim edge is replaced in that case with the uh, assignment edge. Uh, and upon release, the assignment edge goes back to a claim edge, indicating that a process might want that thing again sometime in the future. So here's a resource allocation graph that shows all three kinds of edge. Uh, there's two processes, P1 and P2. Uh, P1 is currently assigned to, uh, sorry, uh, R1 is currently assigned to P1, it is currently requested by P2, uh, and there exist claim edges here from P1 to uh, R2 and from P2 to R2. So uh, looking at this graph, is there a cycle? No. All right, we can see that there's not that many edges. This is not uh, rocket science. So a resource request doesn't change the direction of any of the arrows. So if P1 requests R2, it doesn't change the direction of the line between P1 and, and P2, or you know, of the edge, I should say, to be more formally correct. Uh, it just makes it solid as opposed to dash. Now if there is assignment, if the resource R2 is assigned to P1, then that does change the direction of the edge. Uh, and so basically what would have to happen to use the resource allocation graph to prevent, uh, I should say avoid a deadlock, uh, is that a request is only granted if converting the request to an assignment does not result in a cycle. So uh, if you do a sort of what if kind of calculation and you say, well, what if I grant this request? And if I grant the request, uh, it ends up you know, making the um, graph have a cycle. Then you would say, no, I'm not going to do that assignment right now. We're going to leave it as an open request until it's safe to do that. So what edge would have to change in this diagram to make a cycle possible? All right, so if R2 is assigned to P2, then we would have a cycle in the graph, counting claim edges, because they do count. Uh, and that means a deadlock could happen. It hasn't happened yet, because P1 has not requested R2. The dashed line just means, hypothetically, it could. Now, if it did, that would actually result in a deadlock, because P1 would be waiting for P2, and P2 would be waiting for P1. Uh, indirectly via those resources, uh, but you know, that might not happen. R2 might be assigned to P2, and P1 doesn't actually ever want resource 2, in which case there's no problem. The deadlock did not occur, even though we were in some danger. So yeah, the uh, key decision is do we grant a resource? As previously mentioned, this only works if uh, all resource requests are known in advance, and we have to have some idea about how many instances there are of each resource. Okay, so yeah, we've covered um, a couple of uh, approaches, and uh, what I want to talk about now is the banker's algorithm. The banker's algorithm is intended to be more general. Uh, it is supposed to work for resources with multiple instances. So the uh, previous analysis for safe state versus unsafe state uh, is in fact the foundation of the banker's algorithm. Uh, and uh, I mean, I would you know, be understanding if you said, oh, I thought the banker's algorithm was, you know, well, just do whatever makes you rich. And when you run out of money, the government will bail you out. That's not the algorithm that we're studying here. Uh, that one is more, you know, psychology or uh, sociology, I suppose, uh, than, uh, than anything else. Uh, but why is it called the banker's algorithm? Okay, yeah, so um, the banker's algorithm is hypothetically some sort of algorithm that a small town banker might follow. Uh, I don't know how true that actually is. That might be just like how people who write computer textbooks think that bankers behave. Um, but the banker in this case is trying to prevent allocation of cash on hand in such a way that it's not possible to satisfy customers. Thing is that um, banks lend out more money than they have on hand on the usually correct theory that not everyone will come asking for all their deposits all at once. 
Uh, in fact, if everybody does, not to digress too much on the uh, on the uh, discussion of banking, but if everybody does ask for their money all at the same time, that's called a run on the bank and is generally considered a disaster. It usually indicates that people have lost faith in the bank as an institution in which to keep their money. Uh, and usually central banks step in to you know send more money to the banks afflicted so that people don't lose confidence in the idea that they will uh, ever get their money back. Uh, now, uh, my, my mother's stepfather tells a, a great story, or I should say told a great story as he's been deceased for a while, uh, but told a great story about uh, how uh, you know, in the uh, 1920s he had managed to save up at, at the time about 100 U.S. dollars uh, in 1929, which according to uh, online inflation calculator uh, is something like $1,500 in 2020 dollars. Um, so, you know, a uh, quite significant sum of money for uh, a young person to have saved up. Uh, and he kept his money in an institution called the Bank of the United States. Surely, you could uh, imagine, there is no more solid institution than the Bank of the United States. In fact, you probably think it's presently called Bank of America. It is not. The Bank of the United States went under, uh, and uh, you know, in the uh, bankruptcy settlement, uh, in exchange for you know, the uh, deposit money of about $100 that he put in there, uh, he received a settlement check in the amount of 14 cents, which, uh, for those keeping score at home, uh, is $2.11 in 2020 money. Yeah, um, so, hmm, thanks. Um, the, the more courses you take with me uh, and the more examples you hear where I talk about banks, you might come to think that I don't like them. You wouldn't be wrong. Um, in, in any case, um, the banker's algorithm is supposed to be uh, about you know, allocating your resources in a fashion that tries to keep you out of trouble. So with my you know, long digression about stock market crashes and what have you behind us, let's actually look at the banker's algorithm. Now, the analysis we did before the resource allocation graph one uh, is the idea of whether the state is safe or unsafe, uh, and the banker's algorithm should be executed when you are going to um, grant, or when you're considering if you grant a resource allocation. And we want to know, ultimately, does it move the state from safe to unsafe? So you do a what-if calculation. You say, okay, if the request is granted, the new state of the system is this, and make a determination, is the state unsafe? If it is, don't grant the request. Simple enough. You know, if, if doing this would put us in danger, don't do it. I mean, that, I, I can't explain it any more simply than that. Okay. So if the uh, request would you know, put us uh, in danger, then the request will be denied or the uh, thread or process that wants the resource will be blocked uh, until such time as the request can be fulfilled without putting the system in an unsafe state. And as long as we stick to that rule, then deadlock will be avoided. So the banker's algorithm, as I said, accommodates multiple resources. The uh, textbook that this diagram is from dates back uh, quite a while. Uh, so it's you know full of archaic things like tape drives and plotters and printers and CD-ROMs. And uh, here with the laptop probably has none of those. Uh, and why would you print things anyway? You're just killing trees. But okay, fine. Um, now... The thing is that uh, the previous uh, version of this, where it was just one kind of resource, it was easy enough to represent it two-dimensionally. Now it's gotten a bit harder because, well, you'd have to represent it three-dimensionally, and I'm not really that good at art. So what we have is a couple of tables instead, because this makes it a bit easier to understand. So the left table, uh, or matrix, uh, shows you these are the resources that are currently assigned to each process. So A has three tape drives, zero plotters, one printer, one CD-ROM. Sure. You can name the resources anything you want. These are ridiculous, but that makes it more fun. Uh, and the resources that process A could request, uh, as well as the, those for each other process, are shown in the table on the right. So A could request one additional tape drive, one plotter, no more printers, no more CD-ROMs. Uh, and then on the right of the uh, second table, there are three vectors, uh, and they are existing 
uh, and uh, what is presently assigned, so it's assigned to processes, uh, and then A is for available. So E is existing, P is for processes have, and A is for available. Um, nothing to do with you know, any environmental protection agency or anything like that. So E just tells us what are the total resources in the system. Uh, so there are six tape drives and three plotters and four printers and two CD-ROMs because this is the strangest computer in the universe. That's fine. Uh, currently, five of the tape drives are assigned, three plotters, uh, two printers, two CD-ROMs, and there is one tape drive available, no plotters, two printers, and zero CD-ROMs. Uh, and obviously, for a given column, P plus A should equal E, uh, which uh, means that the uh, uh, resources in question, you know, they have to be somewhere. Either they're assigned or they're available. They can't be anywhere else. Okay, so our approach for checking how a state is safe uh, works, well, just how you would expect given our uh, previous discussion of safe and unsafe states. So you know, given what we have here, um, you know, given the available resources and the outstanding requests, well, here's the algorithm. Look for a row in the matrix R where the unmet resource needs are less than or equal to the resources available in A. If such a row cannot be found, it means the state is unsafe and we can terminate the algorithm. Uh, assume, as before, the process gets all the resources it needs, mark it as terminated, and put all of its resources into the available pool. Repeat those steps until either we've got it down to you know, all processes have finished or uh, we are stuck. Um, there's a note on here about choosing more than one process. We'll come back to it after we uh, look at executing the example. Executing it is pretty straightforward, so it's probably silly for me to you know, hold your hand and uh, run through every step in painful detail. Uh, but basically, uh, we'll look at the available vector and we'll look at the resources still needed column. Uh, and, you know, can we, with the available resources, give everything that A wants? No. Uh, what about B? Also, no. Uh, what about C? Still no. What about D? Yes. What about E? No. Uh, because you know, for, uh, a, B, C, D, uh, for A, B, C, and E, we can eliminate it immediately because there's no plotters available. So what do we do? Well, we give the resources to D because the available vector you know, uh, contains what it needs. There's two printers, and it only needs one printer. So we would say, yes, uh, that is complete. We could then cross D out of the list. Uh, and then we would say, okay, the available resources uh, is now the A vector plus what we just got back from D. You could subtract it from the P vector as well. Uh, and so D has one tape drive, one plotter, and one CD-ROM. So we would add that to the available pool, meaning there are two tape drives, one plotter, uh, two printers and one CD-ROM now available. So you know, 2, 1, 2, 1 is our new uh, A vector. Can we meet the needs of any process at this point uh, which uh, requests those things? Uh, yes, we can. We could pick E. That would work. You could also pick A. Uh, and this is what I mean about it doesn't matter all that much. Uh, it, it actually can never make your situation worse. So... Uh, what do I mean by it can never make your situation worse? So if I choose process A, um, then uh, it doesn't eliminate E, because when A runs to completion and it finishes, it releases some resources. In the worst case scenario, it's actually like process E, where there are no resources available. So uh, if we run E right now uh, and it releases all its resources, we're no worse off. Uh, if we run A, it has some resources, so the pool of resources will increase. So if ever you have two options, uh, or more than two options, for this is a process I could run with the available resources, there's no wrong choice. You could choose either one of them, uh, and it doesn't affect your ability. You won't get stuck, so you can still run to completion. So we could do D, then E, then A, uh, or D, then A, then E. And it will be fine because the pool of available resources can't shrink as a result of this process. So if we add the uh, resources from A to the newly available pool, uh, you know, we will see uh, you know, how are we doing uh, in terms of the allocated resources. Well, you know, now we've increased 
the available tape drives to five and uh, plotters uh, is still at one uh, and uh, printers uh, has increased uh, well, actually has not increased uh, sorry has increased by one so uh, printers uh, is now at three uh, and uh, cd-roms is also increased by one so uh, it is at two uh, and we can apply this vector over and over and over again until we have made a determination of a safe sequence and as I say there could be more than one we've already encountered that you know, once we have chosen D and it releases resources our next choice could be either E or A uh, and that means there exists more than one safe sequence uh, and any one that you give as your answer is fine and that's what I mean uh, with the last couple of notes here on this slide that says look more than one process can be chosen in this step it doesn't matter at all which one because the pool of resources can't get smaller so ultimately what we'll do is as previously mentioned a what if calculation that when a resource is requested we will think carefully about well if I grant this resource what happens uh, and so if we you know, go back to uh, the banker's algorithm type thing if uh, you know we had an incoming request from process e to get uh, you know uh, one printer okay then you would uh, apply that change as in the what if calculation so you would you know alter the uh, matrix on the left such that e is uh, 0, 0, 1, 0, uh, in, uh, in its resources assigned and you would all, uh, update the uh, p and a vectors accordingly uh, and then you would say okay if i do that is the state still safe is the state still safe i'll let you think about that uh, you can uh, work it out sort of by the uh, same procedure and uh, you will make a determination as to if it's safe based on whether or not you find a safe sequence Okay, you should in fact find that there is a safe sequence uh, as, as far as I can tell by just glancing at it casually because if we assign uh, one of those resources to E uh, then uh, uh, then it reduces the resources that it could still need so the uh, resources still needed changes to 2100 zero, zero. Uh, and we can still run D with the available resources and then we can run A and we can run E again so you know, it will all work out just fine. However, we could make another change, which would be an unsafe one, which would mean that uh, that resource request should be denied, or at least delayed. Okay, so here's the bad news. The banker's algorithm is you know, great in theory, but in practice, it's utterly useless. Why is it utterly useless? When I introduced it, I went over a couple of notes about, you know, here are preconditions for the banker's algorithm. And they are things like, well, a uh, process needs to know in advance what its maximum resource uh, needs could ever be. That's kind of unrealistic because, you know, we don't know uh, what resources we're going to want. Uh, especially in a, in a process that's user interactive, you know, I don't know, the user's going to tell me what they want, uh, and you know, then we'll figure out how to do it, so I don't know what resources I'm going to need. Uh, another thing is that the number of processes is not fixed. Uh, it varies with users' wishes. You know, they start processes or they terminate them, you know, things will happen. Um, finally, a resource that was thought to be available can suddenly vanish, you know, unplug a printer, a network goes down, something breaks, what have you. So there's lots of possibility for the resources to suddenly change uh, and change in a way that's kind of unavoidable. You know, the printer breaks, the printer breaks, you know, um, printers are temperamental like that. Um, but if the printer breaks, you know, there's no there's no way you can sort of turn back time and f force somehow the state to go back to safe. That could move you unintentionally to an unsafe state. And we haven't even touched on the problem that we don't actually have a good way to defer or deny those resource requests. So the operating system would have to do it for us. Uh, and basically, they don't. So, yeah, uh, it turns out, in practice, uh, the banker's algorithm can almost never be used. Yeah, that, that doesn't feel nice. 
that doesn't feel nice at all. Uh, you know, uh, the banker's algorithm you know, has appeared in the past, uh, in, at least in uh, UC254, the predecessor uh, course to this as an exam question, uh, just because you know, it's an algorithm that you can execute and uh, you can do an analysis of whether a state is safe or unsafe. But yeah, um, it's kind of useless. So that, that sucks. So that, where does that leave us on deadlock avoidance? Um, ultimately, all of the techni techniques that we've looked at, uh, whether it was just a simple you know, safe, unsafe state determination, whether it was the banker's algorithm, whether it is the resource allocation graph, depend on us knowing things that in practice it's not possible really to know. Right, we don't know uh, what resources are going to be requested by what processes in advance. Even if we wrote the process, you know, there's all kinds of ways that we could be you know, un uncertain. Uh, and it also requires that the number of resources in the system is fixed and never changes. Uh, and that we know is also not true uh, unless you know, we are talking about some sort of embedded system. You know, This is the Mars rover and all the equipment it comes with is all the equipment it will ever have because it's rather inconvenient to install new equipment on things that are currently uh, on another planet. Well, same thing for a satellite. You know, it's a bit of a pain to uh, just fly up there in outer space and you know, plug in this USB device. Um, so avoidance kind of doesn't work. Uh, there are some steps we can take when it comes to avoidance to sort of stay out of trouble uh, without uh, without too much uh, magic or without using things that we can't use or knowing things we can't know, but it's not great. Uh, the other thing is that because it deals in worst case scenario, even if we can do avoidance, we are reducing system performance in the name of safety. You know, if we limit the number of philosophers at the table to one, we're reducing the rate at which they can eat in the name of safety, you know, preventing them from getting deadlocked. You might not consider that to be a worthwhile trade. So ultimately, um, you know, here we are at the end of avoidance. Uh, and we've talked about prevention. And we said, well, you can't truly prevent it. All you can do is make it less likely or you know, maybe rule it out in a few edge cases. We've talked about avoidance, and I've said, well, avoidance would be great, uh, and you know, it would be nice if, if we could do that, but again, only in certain edge cases and only uh, under uh, the right conditions. So um, where does that leave us? Well, it leaves us with the last option for dealing with deadlock that appeared uh, in, in our list. Uh, when the topic was introduced, and that is deadlock detection. And it is you know, with resignation that we talk about deadlock detection as our next topic, which is if we can't stop it, then the next best thing that we could do is notice when it happens, because if we do, then we could have an opportunity to do something about it. But that I will save for the next video, so I will see you then.